thank you chairman for giving this uh, me this opportunity and good afternoon to all the participants who have come here for the second uh, session on budget and inclusive growth we all know that when there are five economists there may be six opinions similarly when we try to take the budget perspective there may be positive sides negative sides there may be certain agreements and disagreements the perception which i am going to present is my own personal view as an economist and also trying to raise certain issues which were really bothering my mind so i thought the issues can be discussed so that to get a great greater clarity into the subject the very topic is quite interesting how the budget is bringing about an inclusive growth and this concept especially when you try to take in the global context too we find that there were radical economic reforms undertaken in most of the developing economies including india in the late 80s and 90s and we have almost all the developing countries have got a very unprecedented levels of growth and to certain extent poverty reduction but the basic question was the benefits themselves how far they have reached the other sections of the society and we have certain problems in terms of development when you try to take the highly developed and the developing economies and within the developing economies the disparities as such so against this background of the globalization there is a market economy from where some people have benefited and we see some people are worse off and they are left behind or what we call as excluded so in the process of globalization also some countries some people were excluded so now if we try to take in our own level of development who are being excluded and after reaching certain levels of development why the benefits of development are not reaching the masses for this we find that even our prime minister has agreed and has given a great talk that the key element of our plan strategy is nothing but inclusive growth a growth to provide the mass of our people access to basic facilities such as health education clear drinking water etc and the government at different levels be it central or state should try to provide or ensure the provision of these services to everybody so inclusive growth is nothing but uh, by very definition implies an equitable distribution of resources with benefits accruing to every section of society so that is the very concept of inclusive growth to put it in a very simple jargon we can say that growth which is fairly shared and that corresponds to two important aspects one is equality and the second one is equity now it how are we to assess equality and equity it includes certain measurable criteria which are intangible elements and the measurable items we can take in terms of metrics such as gini coefficient measuring the income distribution the literacy rates the distribution of public goods education health electricity water supply infrastructure so these are certain things which are measurable and if you try to assess the level of this measurable items as rightly pointed out by the morning speaker professor hargopal ragaru though there is you find that relatively absolutely the number has declined in in terms of there's an improvement but if you try to take a relatively we have not really made a mark similarly when you try to take the intangible aspects which refers to the perceptions feelings the shared aspirations and this is nothing but which are embedded into the concept of inequity 
So knowing inclusive growth, that is sharing the benefits which can be measurable and certain which are not measurable and knowing about the inclusive growth is one thing and really generating inclusive growth is a totally a different matter and in fact in order to increase inclusiveness the key areas which we have to really focus are the development of agriculture, rural development, infrastructure, education and healthcare. If we just look back to the India's population over the last 50 years, you find that from, and if you try to project for the coming years, you find that from 1.1 to 1.66 billion, that's the 30 percent of the India's population are still below poverty line, 40 percent are illiterate, and inclusive growth is a challenge, and government has highlighted inclusive growth as the greatest priority successfully addressing the challenge of inclusive growth will require all possible mobilization of stakeholders as i said including the national local corporates international organizations mncs entrepreneurs ngos so in in real terms if we have to achieve inclusive growth it's not an easy task but it requires the coordinated and conscious efforts of all the stakeholders now with this little introduction, taking the, looking at the budget, under what backdrop this budget was presented, the union budget, we all know that was a global slowdown of the economy. There was a slipping physical prudence, sharp fall in growth rates, agricultural growth slackened, growth in manufacturing sector was negative, high liquidity overhang, and yet high in real interest rates. So this was a bleak picture facing the Indian economy and government had to bring about some improvements and therefore it introduced the three physical stimuli which have not really worked well. That is the injection of liquidity and the tax concessions and the third one is increase of public expenditure. So here again, when we talk about the increased public expenditure, we can link it with the concept of inclusive growth. And without increase in public revenue and the gross domestic product, we are definitely going to have a physical deficit. So any increase in public expenditure, if it does not increase demand, output, revenue, public borrowing will lead to increased interest rate which will crowd private investment. Now this is the phase where the Indian economy that's you're pumping in money and how the interest rates increase in borrowing leading to increased interest rates and this will definitely affect the private investment going to a slower growth rates and therefore there is a need for monetization of expenditure which again will fuel the inflation. Under this background, what are the challenges we have before us in the Indian economy? The first challenge is, again, to bring back the economy to the high growth of 9% a year because we are slipping down in the growth rates, to deepen and broaden the agenda of inclusive development. This is, again, very vital. And the most important is re-energize the government delivery system so that the benefits really reach the poorer masses. It's not injecting of public expenditure alone, but how well it tries to reach the masses. So there's no alternative for us left, except a growth-oriented budget, which will increase the physical deficit to 6.8% of GDP. And if we really add the deficit of all the states, it may exceed to 12%. And this widening deficit certainly poses a major risk, but the government justifies it that it is a risk in the pursuit of a broader objective of inclusive growth. So to achieve inclusive growth, they justify the physical deficit. Now we have to see how far it is really justifiable. Therefore, when we take from the governmental angle, they say it is a very balanced and it is slant to rural growth because uh, a 4 percent increase in allocation for agriculture development and giving more to the agricultural credit 3.25 lakhs and especially the 
National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which is a good scheme, an increase of 144% and 100 rupees wages, real wage every day nearly, which will also be creating about 12 million jobs per year. And many such programs which try to explain that there is some welfare measures being taken up by the government, the Food Security Act, the Rural Housing, the Indra Ivas, uh, Avas Yojana. All these reflect the schemes taken up by the government to bring about some inclusive growth which will try to bring about the growth. The projections of the government are also good. The projections are the real growth will be during the year 11 to 12 percent, the real growth will be 13 percent. The physical deficit, which is 6.8, in the year 11 and 12, they are projecting a decline in the physical deficit, which will be 4 percent. The revenue deficit, which is currently 4.8, will be brought down to 1.5. And the gross tax revenue, which is 10.9, will the revenue will increase to 12.4. So here we have the figures which are quite appreciable but the figures are based on the assumptions and what are the assumptions? That there should be rapid growth and internationally there should be no impact of the rising oil and fertilizer prices. So only if we have a steady growth and international prices are kept stable maybe we can achieve these growth rates. So the question is a big if. If is only if the assumptions are true, we hold the model true. So generally when we teach economic models, the whole model is based on assumptions. If you even take a simple law of demand, it slopes downward. The demand curve slopes downwards based on a simple assumption, Cetus paribus. So these projections are also based on assumptions so let's hope the assumptions are true so that these projections made by the government are quite implementable. Now if we try to really look at the presentation of the budget, as most of the speakers in the morning also have said, the annual budget presentation exercise of the government over the last few years has been seen more as statements of accounts with particular focus on broad policy measures and intent of spending in the coming few years rather than an opportunity for specific details of reform process. Similarly, the massive borrowing will have a very great impact on interest rates, which will have a crowding impact on private investment, which may pull down the economy. The revenue deficits are going to increase from 1% of GDP in 2008 and 9, which have increased to 4.8% of GDP. And we all know that when we increase the revenue deficit, it is nothing but borrowing to eat. The center also have planned to borrow more money. And this could also be an underestimate. And the underestimation is that they have not really given some provision for the proposed Food Security Act. Now, even if this expenditure is included, the government borrowing will be more heavily and that may create more problems to the economy. So now we try to take, in other words, there's no alternative, but we have, they have not at all spoken anything about the returning to the dis, uh, discipline of the physical responsibility Management Act, which is very important because for any economy, physical discipline, physical prudence is very vital, but this budget has not really focused on this physical discipline. And mere increase in expenditure on social development will be hardly helpful without ensuring the delivery at grassroots level. So how best this expenditure will reach the targeted sections of the society is again a very vital question. Now similarly, when you try to take the market's view, there, there's people who believe in the market economy, they say that the spending, it is more like a spending spree the government has taken up rather than a counter-cyclical boost to increase the demand. 
So now, looking at the budget, looking at the government projections, now what really uh, questions my mind, as I told you, there are certain issues which I would like just to pose before the August gathering is, is inclusive growth possible or is it a utopian concept? That is really, can we bring about this inclusive growth? All the schemes which have been uh, really been embarked by the government, are there benefits of development will be shared because inclusive growth is nothing but sharing the benefits to all the sections of the society. So is it a really a concept? Is it feasible, possible, or will it just remain a utopian concept? Now, what we do to the people who have really gone deep into the system, that is when we try to take up the concept of a zero-sum game. A zero-sum game is when one has to win, the other has to lose. And therefore, in the process of development, definitely they are the winners and they are the losers. And in, in definitely, the losers will be the lower sections of the society and how far inclusive growth is feasible. The third one is, are we to believe in Adam Smith's theory? When Adam Smith propounded his theory of international trade, he said the absolute cost advantage, trade is beneficial to trading economies. But if you try to take the development theorists like Franz or Samir Amin or Emmanuel, the development of one economy depends on the underdevelopment of other country. So the development of the rich, linking it to the individuals, the development of the rich, how far depends on the underdevelopment of the poor. So how far really inclusive growth is really meaningful. Last but not the least important question, what happened to our previous 10, five year plans? Is it something like high thinking and no action? Because we have taken so many plans and we have adopted socialism. And in socialism, it is, again, we have to protect the welfare of the people, the interest of the society. And today, again, why are we focusing so much more on the poorer people? Are the earlier plans not focused really on these aspects? So the question is, are we going from top to bottom, there's a macro to micro, or now it is nothing but micro to macro, because inclusive growth is primarily focused on microeconomic undergrowth. You develop the lower sections, it will bring about the development to the higher. So are we going from top to down, or down to top? This is again a question which I think can be debated upon. So in the present situation, what should be our focus? Is it a Keynesian economics, that's expenditure-based growth-oriented budget, giving more focus to increase in physical deficit because it's inevitable, there's a Keynesian concept, or monetary theories of in increasing the money supply in order to come over the situation. So and if we increase the monetary supply, how are we going to overcome the crowding out effect and how are we going to keep up the financial responsibility which is again FRBM Act which is very important. So however, every question has an answer, every problem has a solution. The budget may not answer all our questions, so taking a pragmatic view, we have to take both the short run as well as the long run measures and immediately for us increasing or stimulating demand is very important in the short run and in the medium term we have to necessarily control our physical deficit and in the long run we have to use our money for capital expenditure which is very very important nonetheless social programs are equally important because as we can try to say that inclusive growth is definitely, it is an absolute imperative in order for the global market economy to be sustained and to live in peace. As rightly stated by Professor Harikopal Rao in his lecture in the morning, 
without inclusive growth we may not have peace because there will be lot of turbulence lot of disturbances and lot of social unrest and evil which will be covering the society so the fruits of development should definitely reach the masses and unless they are well protected through various schemes i don't think the society will be peaceful but nonetheless inclusive growth is definitely elusive as it is vital whether we succeed in generating inclusive growth or not more than anything else will determine the kind of planet we inhabit or inhabit it in the 21st century if we are able to bring about inclusive growth we will have a better planet for ourselves but if we are not uh, having an inclusive growth our future will be quite bleak and therefore the inclusive development inclusive growth is the need of the hour but the only thing is that it is not like when we get back to the keynesian economics when there was a depression in 1930s keynes has very well stated that increase public expenditure to overcome the crisis and he went to the extent of saying dig holes and fill holes so even there he has suggested give them some work and then uh, give them money but today's policies i feel is that it is something giving them more free sorts or something benefits and it makes the people feel that it is their right or liability i mean they can take those easily but that should not be the policy of the government you want to give some benefit make them work make them realize the need of earning such a thing but not just giving them some free bees so that it makes them only lazy that's my particular perception of mine so inclusive growth is need necessary it is a must but make the people really the beneficiaries of development and also the partners of development thank you very much